the Apostle John is an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. And in the second chapter of his gospel, the fourth book of the New Testament, we read these words. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they had run out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made into wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And this After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. Now the pastor of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. A terrific chapter, and about signs. The first sign Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, and the last sign, his resurrection from the dead, which his disciples were witness to as well. My name is Michael Chandler, and I'm pastor of the Victor Valley Bible Church in Victorville, California. And I'd like to welcome you to this Bible Honor Day broadcast on the subject of What's with the Water into Wine? The Apostle John states his purpose regarding signs, saying in John 20, 30-31, And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life, In his name, he presents Jesus as the promised Messiah of Israel, the Christ, as the essentially divine Son of God. Then, based on his witness, he intends the reader to experience a profound and life-changing relationship with God, which is defined or given as eternal life. In John 17, 3, Jesus said, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Know God, that is, experiential, real, life-changing knowledge of God. Indeed, Isaiah 35 and verse 5, written over seven centuries earlier, describes Messiah's kingdom as a place where the eyes of the blind see, the ears of the deaf hear, the feet of the lame walk, and the tongue of the dumb sing. In John's Gospel alone, the author witnesses Jesus giving sight to a man born blind. That's in the Gospel of John, chapter 9. 
and new legs to a man who had been lame for 38 years. John chapter 5. John the Baptist, when in prison for his witness, sent two of his disciples asking Jesus to affirm his identity. Christ, at that point, cited his, this very text of Isaiah, saying, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who has not been offended because of me. Luke 7, 22. And so the fourth gospel, then, recounts signs, miracles that point to a miracle worker. Signals, if you will, to direct the spiritual traveler to his destination. The miracles of Jesus inherently convey a message about Jesus. He fed over 5,000 hungry people and announced, I am the bread of life, John 6, 35. He declared, I am the light of the world, John 8, 12, and John 9, 5, and then gave sight to a man born blind, John 9, verses 1 through 7. He said, I am the resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty five, 25, and then raised the dead to life again, verses 43 through 44. His power to heal deathly illness from a distance, John 4, 46 through 54, heal paralysis by a word, John 5, 1 through 9, and even walk on water, John 6, 15 through 21, demonstrate him as Lord of all things. But Jesus' first miracle is most unusual, and readers wonder, what's with the sign of the water and the wine? It's recorded for us in John 2, verses 1 through 12, and like the other wonders, this one too points to Jesus' person, priorities, and purpose. Concluding his prologue, John notes in John 1 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And again, Jesus himself said, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3 17. The role of law, we know, is to condemn lawbreakers. Law, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 1, verses 9 through 11, is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless. 1 Timothy chapter 1, let me just read those verses for us as a cross-reference here. 1 Timothy 1, beginning in verse 9. Law is not made for a righteous person. The whole concept, the idea of law is not made for people who are not given to breaking law. Uh, they're, they're good people. They're, they're not prone to uh, law breaking. And so law is not made for these kinds of people, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, the Apostle Paul writes. Indeed, all who would seek to be justified in God's sight by keeping the law are cursed. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the law to do them. Paul citing Deuteronomy 27, 26, in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, and verse 10. Again, James, writing in his letter, James chapter 2, verse 10, says, Whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. You might as well just commit uh, violations and transgressions against the whole shebang. You're a transgressor of the law. With this in mind, it is instructive to note that Moses first miracle, Moses the lawgiver, the one through whom God gave the Ten Commandments and the 601 some odd laws related to these in the Old Testament, law that came to condemn sinners, Moses, his first miracle was to turn water into blood. Exodus chapter 7, 14 through 15, by this sign, God condemned the sin of and unbelief of Egypt and Pharaoh. Jesus, however, turned water 
into drinkable, health-giving, refreshing wine. Now, in those days, we know uh, wine was diluted to kill off deadly bacteria, as well as preclude drunkenness. But Jesus came to save sinners from the condemnation they deserve as law breakers. By turning water into wine, Jesus showed himself to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. As Jesus told the woman caught in adultery, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more, Jesus says to the sinner. So the Christian reads in Romans 8 and verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus is not turning water into blood, but into wine. We may also see Jesus' sense of priority in the water pots used for this new wine. These stone containers, each containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece, it says in verse 6, were not for drinking water, but for religious purification. The fastidious practice of the Jewish religion held that before one ate, He specially washed his hands to cleanse himself from defilement. Eating with unwashed hands, as we read in Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 2 and so on, was therefore about tradition, not sanitation. Jesus often demonstrated less concern for keeping religious notions than for meeting real needs, and he does it here. In John chapter 5, regarding the man who was healed of paralysis, he healed that man on the Sabbath. And the Jews, it says in John 5, 16, persecuted him, even sought to kill him, it says, quote, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. In the case of his first sign, the host of the wedding was soon to be humiliated before all the guests because the wine was soon to run out. Weddings in those days lasted seven days. It was a whole week-long thing of feasting and enjoying company and having a great time. And wine was necessary for the guests. And they had run out of wine. Oh, no. But Jesus met the need, which is more important than water pots for religious purification. But wonderfully significant, we can also see that Jesus' first sign anticipated his teaching. We have recorded for us in his conversation with Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, the teacher of Israel, in John 3, saying in John chapter 3, verse 3, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You see, Christ did not merely add effervescent tablets, making water taste like wine. No way. He essentially transformed water into wine. In the same way, a person must be born again and experience essential life change. What's more, the water did not turn itself into wine. Apart from the will of the wine, divine power made the change. Jesus not only came to the world to give grace to those otherwise condemned by the law, he also came to convert the lives of otherwise unwilling sinners into heaven-bound saints. This is what the Apostle John writes in John 1, 12, and 13. To as many as received him, that is Christ, to them he gave the power, the right, the authority to become children of God to those who are believing in his name, who were born Not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. The will of the wine, if you will, as I said, did not turn itself into wine. Jesus did, and he can change your life too. Jesus alone met a real need and turned water into wine. Our need for new life is also real, but much greater. Jesus lives today to turn condemned sinners into children of God. And if you invite him into your heart and confess him as Lord and turn from your sin, you too will find new life. Turn to him today, I encourage you, and find new life, new wine, through faith in Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you to hide away in your heart this week, 2 Corinthians 5.17, where the Apostle Paul says, And if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, behold. All things 
have become new. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Again, my name is Michael Chandler, and I'm pastor of the Victor Valley Bible Church in Victorville, California, where we worship each Lord's Day at 1015, Sunday mornings meeting at 16439 Hughes Road in Victorville. Our services are live-streamed on Facebook about that same time. For more information, please visit our website located at www.victorvalleybiblechurch.org, or if you wish to email, my email address is bibletrom at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and if you wish to subscribe on YouTube, please click the icon at the bottom right corner. God bless you, and thank you for listening, and may you live out your Bible in these days.